So, please, Madam, can go ahead with the session. There is some technical problem. Excuse me. Suprita, madam, you are on mute. Uh, yeah, sorry, ma'am. There's a network issue here. Just you as a minute, we'll start. There is some technical problem. Sorry? Yes, ma'am. Just the network is uh, not proper. Is the problem solved? Can we go ahead? Uh, Madam, shall we start the session? Yes, yes. Please, please go ahead with the session. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Harshada Koli Sattam, Assistant Professor in Zoology and host of today's program, Respected Principal, Dr. Chaya Panse, Respected Vice Principals, Coordinator of IQSC and Head of the De uh, Zoology Department, Dr. Vaishali Somani, our collaborators in VISICON, Mr. Gold Goldin Quadros, Principal Scientist, today's resource person, Ms. Danusha Kawalkar, Senior, uh, senior research, bi research Biologist, Salim Ali Center for Ornithology and Natural History. All my teachers and my dear students, I welcome you all on behalf of MD College and Zoology Department. Today we are having one of the session which we plan to have 75 lectures under the banner Azadi Kamrut Mohotsa and all the 75 lectures will be taken by the women which will be completed before 15th August 2022. I invite Dr. Vaishali Somani Madam, IQSC Coordinator and Head of Zoology Department to speak few words. Uh, thank you, Dr. Harshita. I uh, welcome Dhanusha, Madam, for this session. Uh, MD College is having uh, collaboration with research and uh, national seminars and other workshops, and we are very much grateful to SECON uh, for this collaboration. Azari Kamrut Mosav is a series uh, where we try to sensitize not only our students, but city. Environmental sensitization is part of region statement of Maharshi Dan College of Arts, Science and Commerce, affiliated to the University of Mumbai. Then activities of Environment Club and all the departmental activities, we try to have such sessions either in offline or online mode. The students know more about environment, conservation and biodiversity, and also try to find out how they can be part of the Environment and environment conservation. Uh, madam, once again, I welcome you for this session. Uh, over to you, Harshita, madam. I request all the participants to please mute. Okay, madam, please mute yourself. So that you will not disturb the speaker. 
Ayyappan, uh, please keep a watch if any participant is unmuting okay, by mistake. Okay. Please take okay. care of that. Over to you, Harshman. Okay, okay ma'am, sir. Harshad, madam. Ayyappan, sir, can you please... Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma thank you so much, madam. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma audible. Uh, today we have one such eminent personality with us. I was so amazed while reading overview of her work and it is my pleasure to introduce Madam Dhanusha Kavarkar in this session. Dhanusha Madam has completed her graduation in social work and masters in wildlife conservation. She has studied the human wildlife conflict and the suffering livelihoods of the tribal communities in the Navegao Nagzira Tiger Reserve landscape. She has also studied the tiger occupancy in the non-protected area of Nagpur district, the human snake conflict survey in the Kanna Tiger Reserve landscape. She has also worked as principal investigator of the rapid action project based on dynamics of illegal trade of Indian porcupine quills in the Northern Western Ghats, which was funded by Wildlife Trust of India, New Delhi. In 2017, she, she was a junior research biologist for the project in C2 and XC2 conservation of endemic uh, Andaman edible nest swiftlet in Andaman and Nicobar Island. She is currently working as a senior research biologist in SECON under the project Population Status, Ecology and Conservation of the Indian Swiftlet in the West Coast and Offshore Islands of the Maharashtra. Tanusha Madam is also pursuing PhD under the guidance of Dr. Manchi Shirish, a principal scientist at SECON. Uh, uh, Madam is also active as a chief executive officer of a non-profit organization, uh, Spelological Association of India. Madam, we are highly grateful to have you as a resource person for today's program. I welcome you on behalf of MD College to share your thoughts on the topic. Now I hand over the session to you. Thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, this this was indeed a very detailed introduction. Thank you so much. So uh, should we start, uh, ma'am? Uh, yes, should yes, ma'am. You can start. Uh, Ma'am, I just want to know if my slides are visible and is my is my voice very yes, clear? Yes, it's visible. Your voice is clear. Yes. You are okay, ma'am. So, uh, so good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, being here. Uh, yeah. So, beginning with uh, what are caves? So like uh, everybody is always curious about caves because they're dark, they're inaccessible, and they are they are they are known to be very wonderful habitats. So yeah, we to begin the presentation with we'll we'll just know what are caves first. So caves are known to be natural cavities uh, underground, which should be large enough for a human to enter. So internationally, um, it's it's understood that or it's believed. Um, that at least, at least it should be five meters uh, in length so that so that a human can properly enter in it. Uh, caves are generally formed uh, due to weathering and dissolution of rock and are found in uh, numerous uh, uh, rock diversities, specifically limestone, dolomite, uh, sandstone, um, and also laterite. Because uh, MD College uh, is in Mumbai, I'll, I'll be also focusing towards of Maharashtra. So uh, basically, in Maharashtra, we also get uh, caves in laterite and basalt rock. So uh, the study of caves is uh, known as speleology, and the study of cave animals is called bi uh, biospeleology. So the so the people who work on caves are called speleologists and biospeleologists. Uh, just to give an overview of what type of features are found inside caves. So from entrance to the dark zone, uh, we usually get numerous types of features. So the, so the major ones are the stalactites and the stalagmites, which I'll be introducing again uh, later. Uh, coming to zonation of caves. 
so um, usually in all the habitats uh, there are there are always micro habitats so inside caves we have these three types of zone which basically act as uh, micro habitats so this one uh, is the entrance uh, then comes the twilight and the last one is the dark so entrance zone is basically where the sunlight directly comes inside the cave so that's why we can see a lot of uh, floral diversity in the zone uh, the zone there is very less uh, variations in temperature and humidity and is majorly occupied by accidental or facultative fauna which is like uh, which are for example even tigers can use the caves or or like big mammals or rodents or yeah for for the animals which basically come inside the caves for shelter uh then comes the transit zone where no direct sunlight can come except there are cases where um, you get uh, openings in the ceiling of the caves so from there it, the sunlight can enter in the twilight zone so uh, basically there is so basically uh, you can see no floral life uh, in twilight zone um yeah this like i said this is transition zone between uh, entrance and dark and uh, it's basically occupied by the facultative fauna which for example uh, comes inside the caves for some purpose so for example we have uh, bats which live inside cave which breed uh, but for foraging then they go out of outside of the cave so major majorly bats come uh, in this category of facultative fauna then uh, we have dark zone where uh, there is no light uh, and usually has constant constant temperature and humidity uh, which is like obviously believe that it's unaffected by the outside uh, surface uh, uh, temperature or humidity and may have less oxygen and uh, pressure also uh, this is usually occup occupied by the obligate uh, cave fauna which we'll discuss uh, in the later slides so uh, talking about animals inside caves they are major, they are called as cavernicoles so uh, there is a universal universal classification which was very earlier made by skinner in 1854 and then it was later amended by rakovita in 1907 so since then we are following uh, the same classification so based on their ecological roles and evolutionary roles inside the caves which these vary, this diversity of animals so case uh, there are major three categories there are like three types of uh, cave fauna which is found inside caves so first are the troglozoans which i said they usually uh, occur in the entrance zone which are occasional or accidental then the second category is troglophiles which are facultative uh, which come inside the caves for a specific purpose and then there are troglobites which are obligate and which are also called as true cavernicoles so uh, like in every ecosystems there there um, is some source of energy now all must be thinking about how come these dark habitats and like these are dark habitats there is no sunlight coming inside so how does the ecosystem actually works so uh, there are these uh, there are these uh, like th some like numbered sources such as uh, percolating water which comes through shallow stalactites like rain water when when it seems through uh, seeps through the bedrock uh, it enters the cave then we have flowing water there are uh, many times there are cast aquifers like aquifers which generate inside the caves so and also which brings organic matter twigs and a uh, lot of vegetative material inside the caves then there are natural phenomena of wind and gravity like fallen leaves and twigs because of uh, wind which enter the caves there are also tree roots uh, so for example in andaman and nicobar islands where the bedrock is limestone we uh, there were a lot of um, huge trees uh, which whose which roots used to penetrate from these uh, surface layers so uh, one other factor is active movement of animals which brings uh dead or decaying matter uh, inside the caves and the most important the driver of this ecosystem is guano which is uh, fecal matter uh, of animals uh, inside the caves which provides a lot of nutrition uh, to the cave animals so here you can see i have put a picture of himalayan massive uh, scat also which we found in a, uh, one of the limestone caves 
um this is a dead bat and um, which is actually a source of nutrition for other invertebrates and for example these are tree roots which provide a microhabitat to various invertebrate fauna so okay so this is an ecosystem this this has a lot of this has different zones different animals occur in the, in this ecosystem but then why caves are important so um, they they are mostly important because of uh, their ecological values so they have got unique ecological niches um, they they provide shelter to different uh, endemic fauna uh, second is uh, they provide uh, socio economic value such that for example there is this nenital eco cave garden which provides e uh, economical uh, uh, value to the place to nenital so uh, like for example in this uh, this is recently found world's largest cave fish from meghalaya so yeah so this is how uh, caves function as uh, very e important ecological habitats coming to the geological values like i mentioned stalactite and stalagmite so recently uh, there was a stalact stalactite which was uh, collected from meghalaya caves and after after analyzing the stalactite we got to know that we are right now uh, living in the meghalayan age so yeah so caves have this major functions of being the repositories of past information such as earthquake and they also give us lot of information about the past climatic changes whatever would have occur on the planet earth then uh, thirdly is the uh, hydrological values hydrological values as in uh, caves function as a very important groundwater source like i like i said like i mentioned that uh, karst aquifers occur in the in, in limestone caves so for example this is gupta godavari cave uh, uh, in uttar pradesh so i believe it's madhya pradesh i sorry for the typo so yeah so this is uh, what they provide fourthly is the archaeological and cultural significance uh, for example everybody knows the amarnath ice cave which is in jammu and kashmir so yeah so amarnath is also a cave like most of us don't know about it that it's the and it's the oldest known ice cave of uh, on this planet also there are a lot of natural monuments and world heritage sites uh, which are very significant so for example this is this picture is from maharashtra this is a pandav cave from kunkeshwar sindhudurg uh, which is uh, which is no with like it's a temple of a local deity and there are a lot of uh, cultural heritage and historical heritage linked to this cave coming to what uh other different types of caves and how basically caves can be classified and are classified uh, today so if, uh, uh yeah so there so there are these uh, types different so firstly comes the surface level which are basically epigene and hypogene types then comes to shape so caves are horizontal vertical and hybrid also uh, based on their origin caves are classified as solutional flank margin and there are others uh, which i'll mention later then comes the number of chambers and the stories which are single and multi now cave because their major function um, is is like a ecological function is to provide habitat they are uh, they are found in different types such as lattice and dendritic then there are they then caves are also classified on the basis of microclimate such as barometric caves and also there are different types of wetlands uh, inside caves which are like which are called subterranean wetlands and also karst aquifers and like today's topic which is going to revolve about coastal caves so these these caves are based like classified based on their location which is inland and coastal so i'll just quickly go through these different classifications so as you can see in the picture so yeah so this is epigene cave which is found like above ground which finally will anyways enter uh, the underground cavity and hypogene are a purest of the uh, underground cave so here you can see we've just um, this was an andamans so we had to enter a, a hypogene cave using a branch branch of a tree which was like 8 meters uh, deep and this is a classic example of above ground cave ecological networks a uh, lot of times we get to see a uh, lot of caves and then they are connected Uh, to each other via tunnels so such type of networks are called nat lattice networks where two or the caves are connected to each other then is the dendritic network uh, basically um, then like with a yeah their primary habitats so a single cave 
and there is no connectivity to other caves but then it can have a lot of uh, kind of uh, nerves and nodes uh, yeah so yeah based on number of chambers and stories uh, here you can see this is this is a very uh, classic picture of uh, like number of uh, like a double storied cave so you can see this is the first story first story and this is the second story and then there are four four chambers yeah so based on the microclimate the uh, very good classical example is barometric caves the barometric caves are which caves uh, the caves which in which the pressure uh, above the ground and the pressure inside the caves are very different so this is how uh, we classify them based on the microclimate subterranean wetlands are one very important category of wetlands and nowadays uh, uh, we are like paying attention uh, towards them and also ramsar has identified uh, these wetlands into the conservation priority so uh, these are the these are these are the very primary basic uh, definitions like all the underground areas which contains water um, which includes coastal hypogean habitats coastal aquifers subterranean estuaries ice caves and sea and littoral caves are part of uh, subterranean and wetlands coming to the location classification yeah so there are two types of uh, caves when we compare when we uh, think about the location so one is inland cave and one is coastal cave uh, like you can see this is an island and then there is inland and coastal so uh, how are coastal caves formed the the very ba basic understanding is when they are coastal caves that means they are found on coast so that is a primary uh, definition of uh, how do you first define them then secondly there are four four ways in which coastal caves can be formed so for example if everybody can see my cursor so this is a bedrock uh, with the with fractures and large faults and due to continuous wave action these fractures and faults have these these fractures and these faults have come up secondly uh, when the waves keep on eroding these fractures and faults near the edges of water you you get to see such kind of voids so these voids basically are not too deep they maximum go to 0.5 meter to maximum to 5 meter like not uh, a primitive category of then calling it to a cave and thirdly when uh, when the cave becomes open uh, from both the ends like this one so so this is a, this is a basically a formation of a sea arc so so many a times uh, during cyclones and all such kind of formations can be made because of the because of the frequent uh, rubbing of the waves on the rock and finally when the collapse leaves uh, when finally this collapses then you can see a proper sea cave which is formed like a coastal cave and the collapse also leave behind a tc stack so then you could see that here there was a, there, there is an arch and because of the collapsing of the bedrocks and the terrace you can you also get a sea stack so uh, except the coastal caves there are um, n number of other coastal geoforms which uh, which are there on limestone cast uh, coastal area or later at also you will be able to see so basically like i said uh, they are formed due to coastal erosion for example we'll go with the stack so stack will be attacked at the base uh, when when the wave action continues and then there is a wave notch which is found so you get to see for example if you look at my cursor if the wave would have come like that so there you see, you see a wave notch which is in the base of a stack so this stack was documented by me in uh, andaman and nicobar islands and also uh, these type of formations could can only be seen in soluble rocks and which has been eroded over millions of years like this is not this is not uh, going to happen in overnight uh, so yeah so this is sea arc um, which is found in uh, neel island of andaman islands so here you get to see different types of geological uh, coastal geoforms such as uh, sea cave then there is a pillar stack this is sea arc then there is a window and this is a reentrant so basically a lot of times which we call as caves are actually reentrants which we get to see in most of the places so um 
I will be taking you through uh, two case studies in which in two studies actually in which I was involved. Uh, so yeah, so the first one is the coastal cave in Andaman. So Andaman, uh, like, uh, just a second. Yeah. So like, ma'am, uh, just mentioned that uh, I was involved. I like I joined the Sakon as a junior researcher. So that time uh, I was involved in the in situ and ex situ uh, of edibleness with flood project. So here, in, uh, so here in this project, we were actually surveying most of the caves in Andaman Islands and looking for their presence. So uh, during this time, we were surveying Interview Island. So here you can see this is Interview Island. And uh, we were also looking for edibleness reflet and plus also documenting coastal cast forms on both the coast of uh, this island. So yeah, so uh, during the survey, uh, we actually identified six types of uh, coastal cast forms. Uh, I will not go much of details of other cast forms as um, uh, every, ev actually these, uh, these forms are independently so diverse that we can actually have a single webinar on each and every form. So I'll just quickly go through uh, what all we identified and documented. So we, the first one is the phytocast, which is also called as uh, photocarin. These are basically jagged forms. So as you can see, this first picture uh, depicts phytocast. So this is a jagged form of a rock with um, different penetrating holes. Uh, basically because of different animals or wave action, this would have been made. Then we have limestone uh, outcrops, which are basically exposed bedrocks. And maybe these were formed like uh, uh, millions of uh, years ago. And, and then it is because of uh, isostatic uplift also, like during tsunami and all, uh, Andaman was actually uplifted uh, by uh, two to two, like two meters. So then this happens during uh, such kind of natural calamities also. Then third are bioconstructions, which are biologically driven, and these are unique to uh, coastal caste. So for example, this is coral, which is a very classic example of bioconstructions. Uh, this is coastal Karen which is uh, irregular ridges and points. This you get to see uh, like in Maharashtra coast also. Uh, coastal terraces are a horizontally our inclined beach, which is basically due to erosion and also uh, due to natural calamity, calamities such as tsunami and all. Yeah, so coming to the uh, most interesting uh, uh, geological cast form, uh, which is littoral caves. So we identified seven littoral caves in Interview Island. And these, these are the caves which were found in Interview. So yeah, so um, like I said, that coastal caves, uh, like my topic for the today is like they are bi um, biodiversity reservoirs. So then how do we get to know that they are reservoirs or bio biodiversity is by surveying the littoral caves uh, scientifically. So uh, we followed standard survey protocol, which is uh, dividing the cave into one one meter of transects. So you get to see these one meters. And then we uh, map this entire cave till the end point of the cave. So uh, the standard survey protocol has been uh, defined by our team. And, uh, the, and we use a visual encounter method uh, because uh, surveying uh, sea caves or littoral caves as like it has time constraint because obviously because of high and low tide uh, timing issues. So then that's why we had to go for the visual encounter method. So um, what, what all we found in those little caves was, uh, the, these were the indirect signs of uh, different birds and gastropods also, which we got. Then we got, my, uh, we got bats. Uh, AV fauna, we found lesser whistling teal. It was uh, it was roosting in the entrance uh, zone of a uh, coastal cave. And rodents, yeah, we found uh, a nest in the dark zone of a coastal cave. Uh, coming to birds. So it's uh, coastal caves and Andamans are habitat to the endemic AV fauna, which is plume toad swiftlet. Then uh, we also found, yeah, like I said, diversity of gastropods in the entrance zone. Uh, of the coastal caves and spiders. Uh, we also documented calotus. And um, yeah, so there, there is like, uh, well, so I just share a small, small incident. So we were, we were just like surveying a coastal cave and uh, 
uh, we we just had an we thought that how come you know these rice uh, because this eggs they look like a rice flakes and rice so how come you know these landed uh, landed up in a coastal cave and while then when we used torches and stuff then we found that this was a uh, ant colony and then, then we were actually very surprised that how an ant colony was present inside uh, a coastal cave which was which was kind of uh, and this colony was uh, in in a place where waves couldn't reach so yeah so this is like a, a wonderful habitat in a crack of a coastal cave actually then we also found moths cricket centipedes uh, different uh, species of crabs and cockroach which is which is the most commonest uh, uh, cave fauna uh found so yeah so this is this is a gist of uh, what diversity i documented in i mean i me and my team we documented in andaman's uh, coastal cave coming to the uh, study of uh, coastal caves in maharashtra so we actually recently completed this project which was funded by mango foundation mango cell uh, so which was mapping biological diversity of caves in vengurla rocks archipelago which is in sindhudurg so yeah so uh, during this project also we had to survey all the 23 islands uh, present in this uh, island chain and then out of this 23 islands we uh, we could document uh, two voids uh, which is in the new lighthouse island and then we documented two caves in the burnt island i'm sorry just give me a second sorry so uh, so after the survey of 23 islands we could document two voids and two caves um, yeah so again uh, these two caves were uh, surveyed using standard cave survey protocol like i discussed and the cave fauna was studied uh, using standard cave fauna survey uh, using our transect method which is a standard method set by our team so here is the glimpse of what all we found in this uh, wonderful sea cave of vengurla so we documented cockroaches like i said it's the most commonest uh, fauna uh, you which you which you get to sight in a cave uh, we get a we got a diversity of uh, gastropods uh, arene species and lepidopterans uh, plus we also got uh, like this the presence of blue green algae inside the caves like the, specifically the entrance zone of the cave uh, coming to uh coming to the bird bird fauna so so sorry bird diversity so this cave uh, is known to be the most important habitat to this endemic indian swiftlet which is found in western ghats in sri lanka so yeah so this is a scheduled one species and a producer of black edible nest and this is obviously a cave dwelling species and um, this the, the issue uh, in this region the sindhudurg region was the illegal trade which was happening uh before 2006 uh, like people used to come and harvest this nest uh, because it has got a international value of uh, 2000 2005 dollars per kg so so that's why this cave uh, was actually got into protection and uh, also the the island when, in which this cave is the burnt island is also is a important uh, bird area so yeah this is how uh, this cave uh, has uh, provided shelter and habitat to such important uh, species and also uh, which i forgot to mention that uh, this cave is also important because of its uh, geological uh, geological value so this cave is made up of dharwar rocks and dharwar rocks are known to be the most oldest uh, uh, rocks present on the planet today so this is how uh, this uh, coastal caves add up to our our cultural and uh, like geological heritage also so yeah i am very happy to uh, also tell you tell you all that uh, about this work which i couldn't talk much in detail because it's not published yet so uh, this is a uh, this is a documentary uh, which was made by mahar mtb on our work which was going which is going which is actually completed uh, in vengurla rocks so uh, do watch uh, this documentary for details uh, of, of of our study yeah so uh, coming up to if like 
nowadays all habitats all important ecosystems have some of the other threats and are facing challenges uh, for conservation so when we talk about caves the major threat is the lack of scientific research evidence and conservation efforts which we we are now with sacon is also now trying to address uh, second is uh, the irresponsible tourism uh, like which is going on inside caves vandalism vandalism so so this is a very uh, good example like this is from uh, raigad in maharashtra so here people people come and write all sorts of stuff and the uh, names of the of their loved and beloved ones which have died, which have expired and then such kind of uh, vandalism vandalism activities also takes place in the in different um, coastal caves and geoforms then the most threatening is the mining as we everybody know mining is uh, causing pressure on most of the habitats and ecosystems and pollution so this picture i don't know how much um like i don't know how if you can spot so there is a there is a plastic slipper like rubber slipper then there is a ball and there there is a clip so this i found on the uh, in the coastal caves of andaman and, and then i was surprised that how come uh the plastic and all sorts of all sorts of plastic pollution lands up in coastal caves so yeah these are these are major threats uh, to these fragile and unique ecosystems coming to the global scenario, scenario of uh, coastal caves so as you can see uh, mediterranean monk seal is known to uh, like it uses uh, coastal caves for popping and there is this one cave of which is actually called as sea lions cave in oregon coast which is a breeding habitat of these sea lions so uh, in totality if we consider uh, so there was a publication in 2015 which came up and which which gave which came up with such surprising numbers so there are around 2167 taxa which are recorded from 350 coastal caves in 15 countries and very sadly india's uh, none of none of india's uh, coastal caves are included and fingers crossed we will definitely keep on uh, researching and adding uh, to this database so this is how uh, you all can see that coastal caves they act as significant biodiversity uh, reservoirs and yes and as you have known now that they they function majorly as biodiversity reservoirs and are prominent habitats to a uh, diversity of species they deserve further scientific research and conservation actions uh, so considering the importance of caves in indian subcontinent uh, we have recently uh, i along with uh, other eight members we have registered a special organization which only focuses at research and conservation of caves in indian subcontinent so yeah the name is philological association of india so we we are basically um, into scientific exploration study research and conservation of caves and karst across our uh, indian subcontinent so finally i uh, would like to end my presentation by acknowledging uh, uh, the organizers organizers this is zoological department zoology department of md college uh, sakon elvis uh, i also thank uh, principal principal ma'am of uh, md college uh, dr vasali ma'am for inviting me uh, for this lecture then i also thank mofcc and mango foundation which are our funding agencies for both of my studies and dr golden uh, who keeps on motivating and uh, supporting me in all of uh, research and field work which i do uh, dr manchu series he is my supervisor in P in my like in my phd and yeah he is one of my inspiration for cave studies and yeah i have i have like a gang of uh, my teammates uh, who keep on he who keep on motivating me uh, on field and uh, yeah specifically i would mention sudhir because sudhir was with me during our coastal cave survey in andamans and miss pooja was uh, during the survey in uh, uh, maharashtra uh, my field assistants they're always with me during uh, my field studies and without them uh, believe me without field assistants it was very difficult to even reach those caves and i thank all the participants who very patiently have uh, listened uh, to my talk thank you thank you so much
Thank you, ma'am. It was really pleasant to hear from you about your experiences and the diversity of the caves in Maharashtra and Andaman. Uh, our participants, if you have any question to us, you can drop your questions in the chat box or you can unmute yourself. Any student who is on YouTube or watching on YouTube can also post your questions on YouTube. You can take those questions as well. Uh, two students come up with their questions, madam. I have one question is, uh, what kind of difficulty do you face when you are working in these caves or what precautions do you take when you are uh, working in the, in the cave areas? Uh, so ma'am, I'll, I'll start with the problems because uh, I, there, are, there are n number of problems which researchers face when working in caves. So the first is funding issue, obviously. Like, uh, because these habitats are not studied in detail, uh, detail and there's no much attention given, um, it's the first hurdle is to convince the funding agency as to why we want to study these caves. Uh, then the second thing is, because these places are so inaccessible and it's so difficult, like, like you see my thank you slide, we have to reach the sea cave uh, by rappelling. So these are, these are the uh, issues which we face that to reach the habitat also. Uh, uh, like like I show I showed a picture of barometric cave. So there uh, there was a depth of eight meter in the entrance. So it was it was challenging to get inside the cave. So yeah, and many a times there is lack of oxygen inside cave due to due to which we cannot breathe properly. And yeah, so staying inside cave for three to four hours it itself is a challenge. Ma'am, have you uh, gone to any specific training for uh, visiting? I mean, like we have to, you have to climb up to the caves and so, so you have taken any specific training for that? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I have done my advanced uh, vertical caving course. Uh, and I would suggest uh, everybody over here that like if you don't have, if you are not trained properly, you should not enter any, any like kind of inaccessible or which a difficult cave. I mean, like this cave, which is very difficult to enter. So you should not uh, just uh, go and tie a rope and just enter a cave because there are a lot of uh, issues uh, which can come up. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sure the students who are listening would be getting aware about these works and how and precautionary they have to be, even if they are very much uh, curiosity to go and go and just see what is there in the cave. So I'm sure they will be precautious about it. Um, uh, uh, we don't have much questions coming up so far. I think students are taking time to process what you have said. So if there are any questions, we will direct it to you, ma'am, uh, to your email ID. Would that be fine if they have any questions and we can later post it to you? Yes, ma'am, definitely. And, uh, uh, and one more thing I forgot to mention, actually. Like, uh, we invite... Uh, the students for internships and a master's dissertation also, ma'am. So if uh, any of your students is interested, we we welcome them. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, that will be great because our students also have a project work in MSc part two. So if we can find some suitable opportunity for uh, such interested students, it will be wonderful. Because Definitely, ma'am. We will be very happy, ma'am. So we will uh, discuss this with our MSc Part 2 students and if you can kindly give us this opportunity, it will be very much helpful. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So I'm, I'm... Uh, such a rare opportunity to have a interaction with a researcher who is working with cave diversity. Super. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. So I would uh, now take a formally vote of thanks for to you, ma'am. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank our honorable speaker, Ms. Dhanusha Kavalkar, for sharing her valuable time and joining us to share her expertise on coastal caves, the biodiversity reservoirs. Thank you, ma'am.
madam for throwing light on the biodiversity present and studied by you in these caves of maharashtra's and andaman and also for sharing the documentary link which you were talking about about how you have been working and sure in it i'm sure our students would love to watch it and gain knowledge from it uh, looking at your work experiences i would like to extend my gratitude towards mdc kaval verma madam our principal ma'am panse madam for their constant support to bring us such programs i would like to thank dr golden quadra sir all the members of nv secom i would also like to thank all the faculty members from different colleges and the university of mumbai and the researchers from different organizations who have joined us i would like to thank my teacher colleagues from zoology department for the coordination and support in bringing this event successfully i also want to thank uh, ayappan sir sopnil sir and rajesh sir for the technical support and last but not the least i would like to thank all the students and other participants from different places who have joined us on zoom as well as on youtube thank you everyone thank you madam thank you darshana thank you ma'am uh, thank you so much ayappan sir please uh, stop live streaming you can stop recording as well okay ma'am okay yeah, yeah.